All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Curator Connections Cocktails with the Curator and tonight a special guest. I'm Jill Miranda Baker, the Keys History and Discovery Center Executive Director. And we are thrilled that you chose to spend an hour or so with us this evening and we're so appreciative. Before I let uh, Brad have the floor, just want to give it a brief um, reminder if you're interested on Saturday, November 14th from 7 to 8 p.m. is our virtual fundraiser. It's our annual gala. Uh, used to be previous years it was a night at the museum. This year it is a night for the museum together from home. So we hope that you would um, think about joining us. You can do it at the comfort of home, maybe with a small gathering of friends. We have some special um, guest appearances from James Beard award-winning chef Michelle Bernstein, renowned meteorologist Max Mayfield, legendary guide and IF IGFA Hall of Fame honoree Stu Apt, and Storm of the Century author Willie Dry. I know most many of you are, know Willie and he's a good friend of ours. We will have our, we have an online auction which is now open and we will also have a live auction during the event. It is free to participate, um, so, but you just have to register in advance. But if you wanted, if for locals, if you wanted to get a gala to go package, which includes a four, pour, a four course meal, specialty cocktail and wine, as well as a floral centerpiece, you um, have to order that by Friday of this week. So if you're interested, just check us out at our, um, on web, our own website, keysdiscovery.com under un, un, upcoming programs. Um, we would hope that you think about joining us. It's a very important um, fundraiser for us. Last year it raised nearly $100,000 and it's almost a quarter of our operating budget. So any support we get is very, very much appreciated and needed. And that being said, uh, Brad, the floor is yours. All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today we have my friend, Kathy Celestri, or Kathy Lathan, depending on if you're working under her, her pen name or her uh, maiden name for her books or her personal life. Um, we met, I think, five or six years ago at the museum. We were both uh, filming for Canadian TV for different programs. It was kind of an odd, an odd, uh, odd synchronicity. And we became friends ever since. We, we become friends and, and have remained friends. And so we're thrilled to, uh, that she would join us here. Um, this is her first book, uh, Back Roads of Paradise, which is a really amazing uh, trip down some of the old lesser known or lesser traveled roads through, through Florida. And while she does spend a lot of the book you know, in Florida, she does come down to the Keys and explores some of the great history down here and the great, and the great trails. Our, and um, tells great stories, and it's a it's a really fun, remarkable read. Uh, great insights, great places from you know tidbits of history, and we're thrilled to have her. So, Kathy, thank you. Thank you so much. That's a that's a lovely introduction. Can I tape that and bring it with me everywhere? Yes, because that's great. You will uh, you will do it again afterwards, and you can uh, record. You know, I know, no, actually, what I think is so nice is that uh, when I first met you, I had no book to my name, I had nothing, and you were so, so generous with history and so willing to talk to me, and it was just really nice, and for those of you who, uh, I don't think most of you are aware, I am finishing my second book now, which has taken far too long, and there is a great, the intro to the second book. Uh, Brad is there with his wife and uh, another historian uh, because it, it really, uh, you can have these experiences going through Florida and uh, hanging out and just trying to find something that's not invented, something that just happens organically. And, and I had this wonderful experience, which sounds weird, but a wonderful experience with Brad down in Stock Island, uh, I guess two or three years ago now. And it's the intro to the book. So thank you for having me. I love the keys. I love, love, love the keys. There could be a scene of all of us drinking champagne from the conch shell. I'm pretty sure that is in there. That was a very I, I, I'm not sure we want to call it champagne. <laughs> Sparkling wine. I, th I think we want to call it served very chilled. 
So, um, <laughs> yes. so we are going to uh, delve into some history chat. If you guys, if anybody has any questions or any uh, any, any commentary or any curiosity, if you want to uh, explore, we are here for you. And uh, so let's start with a, maybe a trip down to Key West in the 1930s, which is kind of the basis of Kathy's first book. You want me to? You want me to lead with that one? Yeah, I want to lead with that one. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, Isla Mirada is, it, by my currency, too far away from Key West. Not too far away from Key West. I would live in Isla Mirada if I had to pick between the two. But if I did live in Isla Mirada, I would very rarely go to Key West. But I live in a town that's two and a half square miles, and I don't leave that very much. So I hope that um, I'm not repeating something a lot of you know. I hope it isn't. But Key West uh, fascinated me since I wrote the first book and I was following these works progress administration tours. In the 1930s, the federal government, as part of the WPA, paid out-of-work writers to create driving tours of every state. And so there were 48 states. They all got a guide. Florida had a regional guide in Key West. And the regional guide in Key West went into great detail um, about what was happening in Key West at the time. Because Key West, um, you know, we all know it now as, you know, the end of the road, the southernmost point. Um, I, I am fascinating, right, fascinated right now watching what is happening with the cruise ship boat. How did that go last night, by the way? All against the cruise ship. I'm so happy about that, and I'm sorry if that offends anybody, but that makes me happy because uh, Key West has a very unique flavor, but what a lot of people may not realize, and some of you may, so again, forgive me, is that everything about what Key West is now was an invention of the federal government. Um, prior to Florida entering the Great Depression, which we actually did a little bit ahead of the rest of the country because we like to be first, um, Key West was not an arts town, it was not a theater town, it was not a place to go and drop out. It was uh, this, this outpost that in 1830, thanks to piracy, was the richest city per capita in the United States. But fast forward 100 years and they were just dead broke. Uh, the, the mayor petitioned Dave Schultz, who was the governor, for assistance from the WPA and the WPA said, all right, well, we'll give you assistance, but you know, you can't, um, you know, it goes back to that beggars can't be choosers. So instead of getting, you know, we're going to build a bridge like they did with the, you know, the TVA or we're going to build sewers like they did in so many parts of Florida, they said, you know what, we're going to make you into an arts town. And it was this really unusual thing they did because it was just all these descendants of pirates, modern day pirates, Tories from the Bahamas. And they're like, what, we're going to be artists? And that gave us Key West. And so I have a whole chapter in the book. I'm going into this, but I'm fascinated by Key West because it's a, it's a city planning experiment. And if you could think of something that is not sexy, you would say city planning. But there you are, Key West. That's planning. That's, that's city planning. And uh, Brad? Yeah. And um, Julia Stone was the man in charge of yes. that program in, in, in Florida's w, WPA uh, in, 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 in Farrah. He was in charge of the, and Farrah would be the precursor to, to today's FEMA, the Federal Emergency Re Relief Agents. Um, I'd have done a better job than FEMA too, but whatever. But his plan, he understood that Key West could be the potential that Key West had. And he was actually the one, Julia Stone is actually the one who's, you know, who, who, uh, went to clean up Key West and, and, and they cleaned the beaches and painted the houses and created places for people to stay. But the link to Isla Mirada and, and to the Upper Keys is that it was Julia Stone's idea to bring the World War I veterans in 1934 to the, Upper Key, to the Isla Mirada area. And these are the gentlemen who had the misfortune of being assigned to build the solid uh, bridge construction that would eliminate this auto, the former automobile ferry. And these are the same veterans who would later be, many of them, hundreds of them, killed by that horrible 1935 Labor Day hurricane. Now, now, Brad, can I ask you a question about that? Because I've read two different accounts, and I feel like you know. I have read that the train 
that had back it had backed down the track from Homestead during that hurricane picked up some veterans and was swept out to sea. I have read that those were some of the only veterans on the train who survived. Is that true? That is not, no. Okay. No, no veterans were on, actually on the train? No. Um, the, and it was, you know, th this is the long disputed debate of, of, you know, why weren't the veterans rescued and what happened to the relief? But in those days, and we talked about this with, with Billy Dry uh, last month or six weeks or eight months ago or eight, eight weeks ago. Um, back in those days, you couldn't just call your, on your cell phone and order a train down. And many of the people in charge of the, of the veterans kind of assumed that they could just call and have a train would be sent down, you know, in, relatively immediately. But the train was, you know, had to be it was a holiday weekend um and it, it took time to fire it up to, to arrange a crew to get the trains together and by the time it it, it arrived in you know it, it arrived in, in Isle Murata, upper matacumbi key at the train depot around 805 on that monday september 2nd that is where the 18 foot feet of tidal surge from that hurricane came crashing over the island and push the train over. So that train would have been in, not on a bridge in the water, but actually in front of what is today the Alamrata post office. Okay. So, and everyone on the train survived. There were no vet veterans on it, but all the people on the train survived. So that part's true. Everybody yeah. on the train survived, but they weren't veterans. The veterans, I mean, I've read Ernest Hemingway's Who Killed the Veterans. I mean, that whole, <coughs> you know, when I speak Martini. about Florida, people, <laughs> Sorry, people love disasters. I know that's <coughs> not um, now what we like to say, but it, but as humans or perhaps Americans, we love to read about the disasters. Um, whenever I talk about the hurricane of 1926, 28, 35, people perk up because you know everything about each of those hurricanes was spectacularly bad. Even though the United States and the National Weather Service, or what would become the National Hurricane Center, learned so much, um, but people people love to hear those stories. And I remember I was actually at Keys History and Discovery. You had survivors there, and yeah. I remember you had this you had this gentleman. He had to be ninety, and he talked. And I still talk about this in my talk. I don't know his name. And he talked about being a child during nineteen the nineteen thirty five hurricane. And he said, you know. I lost my family. I was a kid and my, and my dad was holding on to my baby brother or sister or whatever. And, and they died. And then he followed that and he said, I actually don't know that they died. I just never saw them or heard from them again. So we assume they did. And that really stuck with me. Like, you know, the difference between how we deal with disasters today and how we dealt with it in the thirties. And, and I think, um, there's something about the Keys spirit for people who choose to live there that really takes a special type of person. And that that's, I think it's special. Anyway, we were saying. Yeah, especially in those days when, and, you know, this is pre-air conditioning and, uh, and mosquito control. So there was, you know, other things that we take for granted today. I, mean, I couldn't imagine living, um, you know, in the Florida Keys in the late 1800s or the 1900s. And uh, we complain about mosquitoes today. And uh, that is, and people talk about, you know, going out to the screen and patio and putting their hand on the screen and then mosquitoes just making it just black. I am, I, I am always fascinated when I see reenactments, not actual pictures, but historic reenactments when they show anything in Florida south of Gainesville and they, they do this reenactment and they've got the women in the, high collars and the frilly dresses and the men and the three-piece suits. I'm like, oh, you've never been to Florida, have you? Because <laughs> there's no way somebody was walking around Marathon in, in, in a wool suit. That just wasn't a thing that I could think they would do. But I'm going to send you a picture later on tonight. <laughs> really? I'm wrong, aren't I? They did. They changed your mind about that. Oh. <laughs> that makes me sad, Brad. <laughs> Hey, if anybody has questions for Kathy or myself, or if you want to ask uh, or explore some other topic, please uh, unmute yourself and, and speak right up. We're here for you. 
If not, I have a question. All right. Do you have the skunk ape in the keys or is that confined to the Everglades? There, and, and I think Kathy should probably stand up and show that fabulous t-shirt. I have a great shirt on. It's the Southernmost Skunk Ape Society t-shirt that I may have something to do with. Um, in 1977, on Key Largo, there was a, a skunk ape sighting that went on for an extended period of time. It would be in the area of what's today Snapper's restaurant. There was a, a, a man and his and his a, a man and his kid were out looking for bottles in the mangroves, which is still something that people do. And um, there was a bad smell in the air, and they looked up and they saw uh, this hulking, you know, eight foot tall uh, creature, kind of crouched in the mangroves. And that creature uh, stayed stayed around for more than a week and was and and was and was um it was investigated by the police on several occasions. There was more than one person who observed it. Um, uh, the family who witnessed it, and this was in the 70s, so that part of Key Largo was not as heavily you know, housed, housed as it is today. Um, but they were terrified and they, you know, they cut back the, the trees around their house by about 30 feet. And then the wife you know, looked out the, the jealousy windows and saw this creature staring in. Uh, she shortly thereafter uh, packed up her kids and, and left, and the husband stayed stayed in the area. The National Enquirer came down and uh, invest and, and looked around and, and apparently took some pictures. The police were there. He was a and 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 the gentleman, hockey man, hockey man. I think his last name is hockey man. Um, uh, was a former you know served in Vietnam, so he was not this, he, and he was a uh, uh, he was. It was not just some drunken observation. It occurred for, for over over a week, and there are four stories in the reporter. It was it was, it was reported in, in the reporter newspaper, which is our local paper, and uh, over over several weeks, this story kept on popping up. So yes, the Key Largo, and, and there was even a T-shirt that was made called "The Skunk Ape Lives in Key Largo." I um. Well, it was a couple of weeks ago that they interviewed me, the Tampa Bay Times, which is our daily paper of record in the area of Florida where I live, which is St. Petersburg, Gulfport, interviewed me because there are people making a movie about the skunk ape. And they interviewed me and they said, well, is it real? And I said what I always say to people, and I will say forever until the day I die, I don't know. I, I've never seen a skunk ape. But I am not going to say they don't exist because here's the thing. Every culture in the world, no matter how much contact they have had with other cultures, whether they've ever seen another culture, whether they haven't, when anthropologists talk to them, they have three things in common. They have legends of ghosts. They have <laughs> legends of mermaids. This is my beer opener, by the way. And <laughs> legends of a Bigfoot. Uh, it, is, it is one of the three things that is unique to every human on the planet. So, uh, what do you think, Brad? Are they real? Absolutely. Well, I'm a big proponent of, the, yes, I, I think they are. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's on six of the seven continents they've been observed, those encrypted of nature. For me, so, Antarctica. Yeah. What? Have they not been observed in Antarctica? Is that not the Yeti? Not that uh, I, I believe Commander Byrd saw one on his very first uh, trip out there, but uh, those documents were lost. I don't know. Okay, fair enough. I can <laughs> tell you that I x-rayed one today. <laughs> Is you the, what, Mary Jo? <laughs> I could tell you. I swear, I must have x-rayed one today. <laughs> Just making a joke. <laughs> Christina, I see you guys have a hand up. You want to unmute yourself and go ahead and uh, first. Happy, happy hour, everybody. Cheers. Happy, happy. We have a question uh, for uh, uh, Brad, you and Kathy. Uh, ever since we moved here, like 10 years ago, we've been trying to figure out exactly where the train cars crashed. Uh, we know it was in front of the post office, but you know that was for a, a length. We don't know how long, quarter mile. I mean, how many cars were there? And we always have a suspicion one of them landed on our property with, and we're pretty close to the post office, you know, the old Russell estate. So okay. 
do we do we know where the tank actually landed? Yes, we do. There, we have pictures to show and everything. Um, the Adamata train depot, which is where the train stopped on that evening, about eight eight oh five on that September second, would have been kind of in in the area of the northbound lane of U, of US one today, right where the um, right where the post office is, and you can see in the picture of the of the railroad of, of the train when it's overturned, Daly on Avenue. Perpendicular there, or, you know, so it was right there at, at, at Deleon Avenue, kind of halfway on either side of Deleon Avenue. On the Gulf side of the highway. Yes, so it would have been surrounding kind of Family Dollar and Tiny's gas station. Right, and we're right next to Tiny's. So but you're on the ocean side, right? No, we're on the bay side. Oh, so that's we're yeah. South. So so it was right there. We're south. Just the property. There was a house. Um, that was built in 1926. That was right behind Tiny's. Um, I can't think of the fisher, the, the fishing guide's name off the top of my head, and it's bugging me. Um, who lived there? And that house was still standing until about a year ago. Oh. That's the first house right behind. There it is. Oh, great! Thanks, yeah. Aaron. Right. So, um, so you can see on the right hand side, there's that. Yeah, right there. Yeah. That is Deleon Avenue. And that kind of squarish area would be where the depot was. And you can see there's a line of Australian pine trees that are on like one, two, two yes. cars, two or three cars down. And that's Deleon Avenue. So that, that's right where Tiny's would have been. Right yeah. there. Yes. Well, yes. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. So you see how how many cars go south of there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looks like seven or eight cars. So our, our property is probably the last four cars. Yeah, right. Or last three cars. So yeah, so they, they, they ended up right on our property. Cool. All right. That's what we wanted to figure out. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that. That would answer your question there. Um, is your property? Did you uh, who your property from? Um, got the, the guy who owned the uh, the uh, trailer park up in Key Largo, uh, or, um, Gr Great America, whatever. Yes, it is. yes. And a, and a, here's a side, quick side note. That's where my wife and I got married on your property. Oh. <laughs> they were friends of ours. For it. <laughs> and we were, we were actually married at sunset on your property you bet i yeah i it's a great place for it so congratulations that's wonderful job. <laughs> it was uh, be 12 years in april but you should come back and see come now. back and visit sometime oh we would love to we'd love it yeah john yeah. john and margaret edwards the edwards, the edwards exactly, yeah. yeah right cool thank you you're yeah, welcome thanks. well thank you <laughs> so yeah so right there your, your property is where it would have been okay. All right. So, what what is the Kathy your your next book? What's what's the focus of it? So you know the the joke is asking a writer about the progress of their book is asking a cancer patient <clears throat> about their prognosis. So thanks. Uh, <laughs> I didn't no, that line. Next, Just next, general topic. <laughs> super excited! We are rounding the corner. We added a chapter, which made it a little difficult. My next book uh, is, is working title, The Florida Spectacular. And the idea behind the book is that uh, Florida, you know, we've been a meme, we've been a joke as recently as last night. And that's not true. That's not who we are. Uh, we are actually a fantastic state. There are so many wonderful, rich experiences we can have here. And every chapter in the book, is something about Florida that is not just a feel-good experience, but is so good that it influences the rest of the country. And, and that's that's where Key West is. It talks about Key West being this this city planning experiment during the the Great Depression, where they just change the makeup of the city to make it vibrant. But there's there's other things too. We have um, my favorite chapter. Can I talk about my favorite chapter? Do I have a minute? Absolutely. 
Uh, my favorite chapter is called uh, The Original Resistance, and it's about the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And it talks about the Seminole Tribe of Indians, and that is what they asked to be called Indians, and how the work of this tribe has shown Indians throughout North America a path out of poverty because they, the, on top of being the only tribe that never signed a treaty with the United States government, they are also the tribe that fought to be able to allow gambling on reservation property. And once the Seminole tribe of Florida did that, other tribes, Mohegan Sun, you know, so many others, Cherokee, they all followed suit. And I mean, we can all laugh at gambling, but when you look at these people who have been subjugated for 400, 500 years, the Seminole tribe is the one who has shown them like, look, you can do this, you can, you can be okay. Uh, but we talk about, uh, there's another chapter about hurricanes and how, you know, our first hurricanes were just devastation for Florida. Uh, 1926 hurricane. We didn't know the 1926 hurricane was gonna be here until moments before it was. And there was actually a weathercaster at the Jupiter office who realized the hurricane was coming. I call him Florida's Paul Revere. Mm -hmm. He took to the streets and he started running through the streets saying, a hurricane's coming, a hurricane's coming, stay safe. Um, the way Florida has historically handled hurricanes has changed forecasting for the entire nation. I mean, there's so much about Florida people should feel good about that we've done so well that we've helped the rest of the country and the idea is that Floridians can read this book and they can, they can decide that, you know, we're not the idiots. We're not the people on Twitter. We're not a meme. We're, we're actually pretty friggin' great. And you know what? I'm going to go to that dinner party and you're going to tell me how stupid Florida is. And I'm going to do what is called Florida explaining to you. And I am going to say, <laughs> well, actually, Florida is pretty amazing. And let me tell you why. Uh, I want Floridians to feel proud of being part of Florida again. So that's that's the book. Excellent. Hey, Christina, your hand is up. Do you guys have another question or? Okay. That sounds awesome, and you know it's, uh, and it's it, we are more than Florida man is the you know the kind of the, the joke, and um, there is so much there. There is much wonder, and like people come down to the Keys, and it's like. It, yes, it's a great place to go fishing and to have a cocktail and to relax, but there is such a tremendous amount of history in the Florida Keys that people really don't realize, which is what people are so surprised at when they come into our little, little establishment here at the Keys History and Discovery Center. And, um, you know, going back to, to the WGA, uh, WGA programs, you might not realize this, but the Key West Aquarium was one of the reasons, was a government-funded no, no, no. It's, it's in the original guide, Brad. The Key West yeah. Aquarium is right there. It was a marvel to be celebrated. And it was built to draw people, yes. to, people to Key West as part of, this, part of this endeavor to create this, you know, as Julia Stone, uh, who, who was you know, the head of, 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 of a fair in, in the 1930s, wanted to make it the, the Gibraltar of the South. You know, he had really high expectations. I, I can't say enough about the extraordinary nature of the Florida Keys when it comes to, um, I mean, everybody, other than Susan and myself, everybody on this, this cocktail hour tonight, you live here, you know this, there is nothing like this in the rest of the world. There, there, you live somewhere that can't be replicated and and everybody should be proud of that they should be so just proud and amazed that they live in this little string uh, of islands that are just amazing and um the key west aquarium yes that that's great but you know what you, you kind of glossed over it brad but the fact that you can all walk out your doors, cast a line, catch bonefish, you can you can be in the Everglades in 20 minutes. You you affected by the Everglades. It is one of the most precious, beautiful things on the planet. And I don't think we give enough credit to that. I mean, when we're making fun of Florida and we're talking about votes and this and that or, or whatever we're doing to make Florida sound stupid, we don't appreciate 
all the extraordinary things about Florida that don't exist anywhere else. And, and what it takes to be one of those people who live somewhere where that doesn't exist anywhere else. I, I, I'm a huge fan of Florida Keys. I don't know if you can pick it out. I think everyone here is a huge fan of Florida Keys. I know I'm, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that I ended up, I was supposed to be, uh, was supposed to be, you know, I first came to Florida, I was on Captiva and Sanibel. And only my story is like everyone, everyone else's story. I was just going to the University of Miami, getting my WPA, or getting my, my MFA um, there, and would come down to the Keys, you know, on long weekends to, to visit, and then ended up staying, which is, which is everyone's story. Christina, do you guys have a question? Uh, I had a question specifically for you, Kathy, um, about hidden places people don't know about. The, the great little spots here that even though we drive by them a hundred times, we never stop. The like, to, yeah, behind the library. Wait, where, where we voted, park. we just realized there was a park behind the library. Didn't even Who know knew? it was there. It's a great park. So, so where are two or three little great places here that we overlook? Are you asking specifically about the keys? Yes. Oh, wow. Challenge me because I'm like the one <laughs> here who doesn't actually live in the keys, but okay, I'll, I'll work oh. on it. Um, we'll if, I had out, Kathy. Up, if I well, had to think about the places yeah, the keys yeah. that made me happy, um, you know, everybody knows Harry Harris Park. Everybody knows Anne's Beach. Everybody knows Key West. Um, there's some really just tiny little places I go. Um, see, this, this, and now all of a sudden I feel awkward because I feel like you're going to know them all. But, um, or broader areas. I go to, I go to Marathon and there's this place, I feel like it's mile marker 67. It's on the bay side of Sombrero Beach. And 50, 57, probably. 57? Yeah. And you go, um, basically west uh, it used to be called tropical cottages they had six little cottages there and you go to the <laughs> end of the street and you could put in and you could just paddle and i mean it was not a fee it was not a boat ramp it wasn't big enough to let boats and it was just a nice place where you could put a kayak in or you could put your mask in the water and you could you could snorkel and you could have a good time the other thing and i'm sure everybody here knows about this is the key largo cuts mile marker 108 um, it's, uh, I, the only place I've ever really successfully paddled from it is if you go to, Brad, you have to help me. What's the name of the, the bar that was supposedly in the movie Key Largo? Caribbean Club. Right. So you put in there on the beach, then you go south and you go east and you go, I, mile marker 108, you go under the bridge and all of a sudden you're in a subdivision and you look down these walls and they're like, five six foot walls and they're just fossils in the limestone and you see this whole timeline of the keys geology and it's just amazing but the current is tremendous the current is not uh for beginners you want to just be able to paddle so <laughs> that, that's adam's cut now be uh, i think it's, is that what it's called? Marker, adam's cut i think it's bond marker 102 ish 103 right. somewhere around that area so that, I'm sorry, that, that dates back to the first time I went to the Keys. And again, cool. almost everybody here lives in the Keys, so forgive me, but you have to remember, I'm a Floridian. I grew up in Florida. I got to college, and I took this class, and they said, well, we're going to take a field trip. It was uh, identifying Florida biota. It was a great class, college. And he said, we're going to take a trip down to the Keys, and we're going to take you, and we're going to show you some biota. And they, they took us. And they took us on this trip and I'd never been to the Keys before. And they drop us in these kayaks and they have us paddle through that cut. And for somebody who wasn't used to Florida going down that far, it was just this amazing magical experience where we saw eons of history right on the walls. And, and again, y'all live here, I get it. You see it all the time, but you have to remember for the rest of the world, that is an exquisite experience and it's life changing. It's hard to imagine. People understand that, you know, 100,000 years ago, uh, the Florida Keys were a thriving coral reef. And that is the basis on which these islands were, were limestone. You know, that, that's the basis on which the, 
our you know our communities are built, which is why it's so so hard to dig when your wife asks you to dig a hole in, in the yard to plant something. Um, you hire that out because your back is getting older and, and, and is, is not very good at that sort of thing. But there's so little topsoil. It, it really is amazing. And that's why when, when you're walking just around, you know, around the islands, um, there are so, there's so much fossilized coral rock just kind of laying or just kind of on the surface and laying around because we are walking. Oh, we have a guest. A guest there. We have. Um, we're walking atop, you know, a, a former coral reef. And, <coughs> and just a brief, <coughs> excuse me, note about Adam's Cut. When the wind blows, a little bit chilly. That's also a great place to go shrimping. Really? Yes. And it's really. I uh, that in in three weeks when I am there. Yeah. If, if, just, if, if, if there's. <laughs> a breeze and, and it's cold. People go out there you know, uh, with their boats and they and, and dip net and dip net all these shrimp that are going past. And I know that uh, Jill has uh, Jill's son uh, Mason goes shrimping on occasion. And um, we've been the be benefactor of my house of some delicious local shrimp. It's, it's really a tasty way to uh, to end the day. But you gotta well, have the cool weather. Yes. Well, yeah. Okay. So again, up here. Seven hours north of you. What's cool down there? It's got to be cold. It's got to be yeah, sixties. Like oh, no, 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 no. I it's will all accept. Relative. It, it, it's Florida Fine. cool. It, it's South Florida cool. That's good. Down. No, that's good. You'll have iguanas, right? One or yeah. two. One or two per per square inch. Um, so I'm curious of everybody here, who was, is anybody here a Florida native as in born in Florida? Can y'all raise your hands? I'm really curious who's, Jill? Okay, anybody else? Aaron. I am. Yeah. She's yeah? Multi-generational. So I can't tell you how many, how many groups I speak, speak to where there's nobody who was born in Florida. Because I moved down when I was seven. I don't even count, but... I'm always curious. Um, who other than Jill said they were born here? Me. She's Aaron, a, where were I'm you born? Worker. I was born in uh, South Miami Hospital, but my I'm sixth generation local to Tavernier here in the Keys. My family moved here in the 1860s. And do you know why they came down? Do you have any? They actually came up. Um, they moved from the Bahamas via Key West, um, and they were farming in the Bahamas and looking for a new place to farm. And so they established homesteads, a homestead on the south end of the island of Key Largo. What did they, what did they grow there? Any chance pineapples? Um, yeah, mostly key limes and tomatoes. And people, tomatoes were a huge, a huge uh, produce product here in the Florida Keys, and very. And, and there, there are um, newspaper accounts from like the, uh, like from Fort Myers area, talking about how awesome the the, the, the Key Largo and, uh, and Florida Keys tomatoes are. In that area where where, where Aaron was grew up and her and her family was notoriously, uh, you know, locally famous for. For the um, for tomatoes, and what's really cool is that there's this description that that, that um, Aaron has talked about how you know how they because you know it, it's rocky soil, not, not a lot of topsoil. You don't think of this as farming country, but the Upper Keys were this was all farming country originally, and um, but it but you know finding a place to plant was difficult, so people would. You know, and and Aaron's family, you know, would have a stick in one hand, looking for places to find a, a deep enough soil to plant a seed, and then dropping a you know then dropping a seed in. And we've talked about this story several on, on several events. That this topic has come up. What was really cool is that I came across some some historic documents saying the exact same thing that were you know not affiliated with Aaron or her family. So it was so cool to see that kind of connection. So my great grandfather wasn't telling a tall tale. There are other people that substantiated that's 
that's how they would um, lay out their groves or their fields. Um, my great grandfather would say, you know, if you looked at his lime grove, it looks like a blind person laid it out because they were just literally all over the place, but it was wherever they could find a pocket of soil deep enough that that plant would thrive. Produce, produce uh, uh, trivia there. <laughs> and it was melons, it was cucumbers, onions, and we're talking onions that, that, that they're described as like three quarters of a pound each. I mean, big onions. And, uh, and, and key limes, pineapples was the original big, the original big, you know, big harvest. And then uh, the turn of the 19th century, there was several hurricanes and Flagler's Railroad uh, kind of inhibited the, the pineapple uh, growing. And then from that point forward, the, the key limes and tomatoes and other vegetables really became became more, uh, more common. So Brad, I have a question, or Mary Jo, go ahead if you, well, I, I had a question about um, Adam's cut, because I think Kathy brings up a great topic there, um, because it doesn't seem like we have a whole lot of those man-made waterways here in the Keys. You know, we rely on the natural gaps between the islands. Um, do you know the backstory behind Adam's cut and kind of what brought that to fruition? Once upon a time, I could tell you that. Um, <laughs> I know, I think Barney Walden, Walden, um, that might be a mistake on the, on the last name. He was the one who created that, but they, they had to build, because it was cutting through limestone, had to figure out some kind of contraption that would cut through, you know, 10 feet or 15 feet of, of, uh, uh, of limestone wall to, to create that pass. And I don't know the story as well as I did when I did my Key Largo boat, uh, book with Jerry some years ago. Um, but but it, it was all about, you know, trying to create a, a quicker passage between the bay and the ocean. So, so boats didn't have to go all the way, you know, to Plantation Key, to, plant, to, to, Tavernier, to Tavernier Creek to, you know, kind of work their way around. Was that another Alonzo Cawthron project? I don't know if he is associated with that because Alonzo Cawthron was involved in a lot of construction in the area. And, and he, his big thing was he had the dredge to help do that. So I'm sure that, that I'm sure it's connected in some way, but there was this, um, but there was a whole other dynamic of trying to create a, a device that would, that would cut through, you know, kind of this new, medium of, of, of limestone. Uh, Brad, you talk about, I'm sorry, when you talk about Cawthron, are you, is that the same family that's, uh, am I remembering the name incorrectly? Is that the same family associated with the uh, Theater of the Sea in Alamorada? Yep, yes. Oh. Yeah, they, are uh, they I'm sorry? Are they still around? Uh, yes, uh, Alonzo's daughter, uh, Carol Ross, is still living within a, probably a coconut's throw from where we're sitting, where I'm sitting right now. And uh, yeah, there's still, and, and there are so many projects that Alonzo and his father before him, they built the Matheson House out of Lincoln Vitae Key. They built uh, on, uh, on Greyhound Key, which is now where the, uh, uh, the KOA, it's Fiesta Key, where the KOA campground was. They did a lot of work, he did, did a lot of work there, did a lot of work down at Duck Key, um, and tons of work uh, up here as well. But yeah, uh, the, the Tavernier Hotel, another one of their programs. Um, a, the, his partner was, uh, was Bertha Felton. So they had the A, a and B. A and B was Alonzo and Berlin, Alonzo Cawthorn and Berlin Felton. Uh, they had a, a, a lot of different uh, properties. And the last, uh, the last two that are remaining is the A and B Lobster House in Key West is Alonzo Cawthorn and, and Berlin Felton. Apparently there was a parting of the ways between the uh, Cawthorn and Felton and um, they kind of divvied up the properties and Berlin, and Berlin Felton is the one who uh, built the Rustic Inn, which is the precursor to the, uh, the Green Turtle back in like 1932. But that's, yes, same, same Cawthorns. That's, uh, that's really interesting. I, I think it's great that you can trace history that closely. Not every city in Florida can do that. You can 
pinpoint it like that. And that's one of the nice things about it. We are essentially a small town. I mean, the Florida Keys are essentially just a series of small towns. And that's one of the advantages that we're able to kind of, um, you know, makes it more, e more easy to, to you know, trace those roots. And while the, you know, 1935 Labor Day hurricane destroyed so much of the, so many of the artifacts and, 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 the, uh, and there's so much loss in that hurricane, but one thing that, wasn't, that was not lost are these, these pioneer stories, you know, that, that are still told and still connected, which really, you know, which is why we're here at the Case History Discovery Center, trying to, you know, to continue to, you know, to preserve and, and to communicate these stories to people who want to come down here and go fish and drink and have a good time, you know, and, and are surprised at, the, at the, the, the really incredible breadth of history that really does inc incorporate these islands. Well, I mean, I think it's great when you talk about pioneers, um, there's a certain faction of America. When you say the word pioneer, they think of Laura Ingalls Wilder. But, I mean, there's a very different, hardier pioneer when you talk about the people who came anywhere south of Gainesville before World War II, and then even after World War II, the people who continued pushing south and, and made it down to the Keys, or the people who were in the Keys before World War II. It's a very different, rugged experience. And it's, um, I'm prejudiced, which I freely admit. I think those people are more attuned to survival than people who went west, because it, it's not just a frontier, it's a frontier with malaria, mosquitoes, alligators, venomous snakes, and, and it's just incredible that anything sprang out of it. And so much did. I mean, and you. And so much great history, you know, and, and so, so many great stories and so much, you know, there's so much, you know, people, and what, what kills me, and I'm sure everyone in this area, you know, can, can agree on, is that when you say, people come down here, they're like, where are you going? Oh, we're going to the Keys. You've been in the Keys for 30 miles. You, 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 you know, these are the Keys. The Keys are more than Key West. And while Key West offers, you know, amazing history and really is the, you know, the heart spring of the Florida Keys, there is so much that was happening, you know, above and beyond, literally above, and, and you know, and, and beyond the borders of, of, of that little island, you know, the southernmost island on the overseas highway. Can I say something without making all the people here hate me? That's up to you. <laughs> I it's work out. Key West is my least favorite key. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure you're not alone. There's a lot of people, it's too crowded. It's, um, hey, the key might have something else to say. I, I, I would love to hear, hear his take on that. He's going to, he's a big fan of history and knows, and knows a ton. Um, but, 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 you know, I think in, in many ways, Key West is the worst thing that could come of a resort chain. I mean, I get it. I love, I honestly love the WPA experiment because it was the most successful experiment in city planning history. I get that. I love so many things about Key West, but I was, I mean, well, I was in my late 30s before I even went to Key West for the first time, and I've been going to the Keys since I was 18. And, and everything about the Keys that I love has nothing to do with Key West. It's, it, it's a different country, and that's okay. It can be a different country. But I think sometimes we undersell everything about the Florida Keys that's great when all we do is talk about Key West because Key West is its own disparate history. But uh, Summerlin Key, Big Pine Key, Stock Island, for God's sakes, um, Marathon, Isla Mirada, Tavernier, Matacombe, it, it's all these other things that are just different people. And I, I worry sometimes, just like we undersell so much of Florida when we only talk about the five things that make it on the news, I worry that we're underselling the majesty of the keys and the things that really draw, honestly, probably everybody who's here tonight. Um, you know, it's not an easy living. None of y'all have the easiest life. You have the most expensive life. You have a life that is endangered by sea level rise. You have a life that is still part of Florida that the rest of the country seems bound and determined to make, a fun, make fun of. 
And you have all these other beautiful things that I feel like all the time we gloss over. And I don't well, know. I, I feel like we do a disservice well, to one all thing the... I, one thing I will say about, I will comment about that, is that what I've learned in my time since I've been looking at the history um, over the last decade or 12, 13 years is that you, you can't tell it, it is a series of islands that are connected by a highway today, but you really can't, but you really can't tell a Florida key story. It, it's not, they're, they're all connected. It's really one large island interrupted by a series of passes and bridges. But, there, but everything, every story, and, and the more I learn and the more I study the Florida Keys is that the more I, I learn that the islands aren't as isolated or as separate as, as they appear to be on a map or by people looking at them. The history, the stories behind them are so intertwined that it really is, you know, one large community separated by, you know, huge backyards kind of a thing. I will say that. I always think about the difference in the keys and how they were connected. And I think uh, one of the most uh, perfect examples of this is Indian key. Which oh, is my favorite. Indian key is not connected to anybody by roads. But what, what year was it? It was the county seat of Miami-Dade. Am I, am I remembering that correctly, Brad? Well, Wasn't it? In, in Dade, there was no Miami-Dade at that point. But yeah, 1836, it was connected. But in those days, there were no roads. It was all boats. And Indian Key is a perfect example of, you know, a small community that was, that, that was or a small island with access to the reef with, you know, a... a, a, a fairly decent uh, natural harbor. So it was, in those days, very accessible. And it was, you know, it was the largest, it was the most important island in the Florida Keys for a time, not named Key West. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, and today, the five zillion people who drive to the Keys have no clue that it exists because it's not along the overseas highway. But it, it's just important rich part of the fabric of your history and it, it can't be sewn out of it i mean it's i don't know i mean i just love everything about the way the keys interconnects and i i think that sometimes we tend to overlook that as a nation oh. because it's a beautiful tapestry but Absolutely. before the wpa highway uh you all the keys were connected by boating right i mean there was no highway connecting or what was there Oh no! That, um, prior to you know, prior to nineteen twelve, basically there was only boat traffic. Right. You know, so you know, in the eighteen hundreds and you know, early nineteen hundreds, the only way that you could, you know, get your mail or your coffee or your friends or whatever was to hop on a boat, and you know, go to Miami or go to Key West or go to Charleston or Boston or Philadelphia or New York and and you know. But, but but Key, Key West has, had been there as a, as a big uh, wrecking community for a long time. What, what did the WPA do specifically to bolster Key West? Oh, may I? Please. Uh, so, uh, you know, of course, the uh, Overseas Railroad had gone from Homestead into Key West, but then the Labor Day hurricane of 1935 had absolutely decimated that. But forget that. Um, Key West, Key West started, uh, you know, without going into too much U.S. history in the four minutes we have left here, essentially when the rest of the, the colonies in the 18th century said, oh, you know, screw England, we're gonna, we're gonna declare a revolution, there were two Florida colonies that went, you know what, we actually kind of like the U.K., we're gonna hang out. And so what happened was, all the Tories fled to Florida. And Florida at that point was uh, the 30th parallel, 30th parallel of, anyway, the St. Mary's River down to Gainesville and then Key West. And a lot of people, there was a lot of, of things happening at that point on the, on the Caribbean stage where Spain and France and the United States were all 
jockeying things around. Um, and essentially, um, at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, the UK um, took the Bahamas and gave it to Spain. So all the Tories in the Bahamas fled to Key West. Now, of course, at the end of the Revolutionary War, what happened was uh, Great Britain lost, which I think at this point we're all reconsidering, and uh, <laughs> Florida to Spain. So all these Tories who were super loyal were still there, um, a little fish out of water, but still better being part of the United States. You know, they're happy there. And um, they start wrecking. That's, that's when the piracy comes into play because at this point, Spain, the UK, and the brand new United States are all at odds. The Caribbean is this hot spot uh, where everybody's trying to figure out who's going to dominate. And Key West, which is Spanish Florida at this point, um, is, is taking all these, these ships who want to come through the Florida Straits, they want to come through all this, and they're wrecking and they're making all this money and they're doing great. Until uh, there was a lot of weird and wacky things that happened that were not good. Uh, Spain says, you know what, we don't want Florida anymore. It's just too much trouble, take it gives it back to the United States. And the United States starts doing things like installing signal lights, all this. Huh. West then goes from being the wealthiest city to going broke. And, and, and then it becomes the process of the United States coming in and trying to help it. And the United States says, you know, it's great you have these Tories. It's great you have these patriots from the UK and their descendants. I'm so glad you have pirates. Screw all that. You don't get to keep that. We're going to take the WPA and we are going to give you artists because that is your path to the future, Key West. We're going to give you pageants, we're going to give you operas, we're going to give you murals, and we are going to make this a stopover that everybody in the world is one going to go to, and it's going to be great. And, and they took these descendants of pirates, these descendants of patriots, these descendants of you know, Indians, these people who had no artistic background, but they were broke, and it was, it was the <laughs> And they trained them to be painters. They trained them to be in, and they brought in out of work artists from all over the United States. And they created this beautiful artist colony. And, and if you think about it, it's brilliant because they said, you know, we're going to take this little spit of a rock. It has no beaches. It has really no resorts. And we're going to make it a tourist mecca. And it was just the sheer will of the U.S. government and marketing. And now it is one of the top tourist destinations in the United States. That's because of that. Yeah, no, I mean, that is exactly what happened is the United States decided they would be an arts colony. But Flagler it's did it. He went, he took the train there before all that, just for, just for commerce. What was Flagler's yeah. reason? Yeah, oh. He wanted to be the Panama Canal. He wanted to be the train that went the closest to the Panama Canal. He was bringing rum in from Cuba. During prohibition, they would bring coffins in and the cause of death would be listed as alcoholism. And that's how they would know that the coffins would be filled with boots. <laughs> it's also important to, to point out that Key West was not Flagler's ambition. Mm -hmm. uh, was Flagler's ambition. He was, because the, the train went to Key West, but then all those cars went to Havana, where yeah. Flagler had invested in... in oh. Invested in, in, in farming and things, and so all those cars would, would go to Havana, be filled with be filled with you know uh, molasses and fruits and vegetables, and then come back to to Key West, and then and then roll up to uh, to East Coast markets, help to drive our local farmers out of business because Flagler charged a cheaper tariff on Cuban farmers, pineapples in particular. Than he did to, to local farmers. Now, according to the WPA, Brad, there was a day where all the pineapples would come through and they would call it Pineapple Day in the Keys. Are you familiar? Oh, I've, I've not heard that, but it makes sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, Flagler didn't give a rat's, if I may speak frankly, didn't give a rat's red ass about Key West for tourism. It was, a, it was a means to Havana. It was a means over to the Panama Canal. He didn't care about Key West. Nobody did. And, until after Flagler was dead, and they had to do something with Key West. They had to help it. It was begging for help. It was broke. Oh. Didn't at one point they actually contemplate 
moving all of the residents out of Key West. They just, before deciding whether or not they were going to invest money in saving it, they, they actually contemplated repatriating everyone to the mainland? Yes. I believe it was cheaper to send people down to fix it up than doing that. That was definitely, that was, that was part of the plan. That was one of the plans. This is, this is the Great Depression, and, Monroe, and Florida is bankrupt, Monroe County is bankrupt, Key West is bankrupt, Flatters Railroad is just about bankrupt. Had the hurricane not come, Flatters Railroad would have gone bankrupt anyways, because um, th there was competition between the uh, other areas. But yeah, so that, that was one of, the, one of the thoughts was, let's just pack everybody up and move them to the mainland. But fortunately for everybody here, that didn't happen. Can I? Yes, Mary, Mary Jo has a Go question. This time. Yeah, no, I just have a question in regards to Lingham Bitey. The, yes, Matheson yeah, House, the Matheson House, I forgot what year that it was built, but there on the property there, there is a Quonset type structure for, her, for shelter from storms. Was that ever used or? Mary Jo, can we can we hold that question for December second? We have a lecture on the history of Lignum Vitae Key oh, with one awesome. of our attendees, Peter Jutro, who's here with us tonight. Oh, okay, fantastic. He's gonna do a whole lecture on Lignum Vitae Key. Awesome. Hold that thought. <laughs> Peter, note that question, please, sir. I got it. <laughs> I noted it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Perfect. Guys. Thank you. Well, this has been a great uh, a great. I think it's been a great discussion. Uh, if anybody has last minute questions, it's just after eight o'clock. We should probably wrap things up. Um, Seven, not eight. We have one final Sorry. question. Yes. Did you finish your puzzle? <laughs> <laughs> you saw that, huh? No, I, 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 I don't think we've called a winner in the presidential election yet. So <laughs> you've got a little time. You've got a little time. I have some time. Probably a week. I have I have a few hours at least. We're close. We're very close. Thank you for following me. Hopefully on Instagram and you're not in my house watching me. So. <laughs> Just Alexa, are you watching me? <laughs> it's fine. You know, whatever sells books, I don't care anymore. So. <laughs> Brad, thank you so much for having me. This is great. I'll be down in a few weeks. If anybody wants to send me an email with stuff to do. Always looking for new things, be in Alamorada for a week, chilling in a cottage by myself. But I love it down there. Y'all are so lucky to live there. Well, make sure you come by the museum. You haven't been here in a while, I think. I was there last year. Okay. Oh. I'll be by. changed a little. But I'll stop be... by anyway. We'd love to see you. No, I always stop by. I love your museum. I am president of a museum in Gulfport, and you guys are, I mean, y'all are... Y'all are up here. It's pretty great. I love nice to hear. Every you you are the uh, paragon. Thank you. Oh. All right, everybody. Kathy, Brad, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being with us. So nice to see everybody. And uh, next we have a lecture next week on Wednesday with um, Moat Marine Scientist about the coral baby boom, sexual reproduction's role in reef restoration. Not necessarily a history talk, but a discovery talk on our other side of our name. So sex always sells. Come on. <laughs> yes, it is all about sex. Somebody said that earlier. <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Joe. This was great. I'll see you both soon. Have a great night. Bye bye.